Is AI the prescription for equitable care? Before we talk about equitable care, how do we even make machine learning models now? Well, let's say that we want to build a triage model, something we can deploy in a hospital so that when you come in and they take a chest x-ray, we can say, are they healthy and they can go home, not a problem, or you need to wait around in the hospital and we need to have a clinician see you. The way we do this is we take a lot of data. That's the first step in the process. We could take over 700,000 chest x-rays. And then we collect labels. If we want to do a triage system, we probably want to collect the label no finding. You're healthy, you can go home. And then we optimize an algorithm. We train a model like a dense net, which is a kind of convolutional neural network. And then we predict this outcome. And we make sure that the model does state of the art. It does as well as or better than human doctors that we might compare it to. And this is often how we deploy models. This is how the FDA might clear a model by looking at this performance. But the question is, how does this do on all people? So for example, let's look at the difference in this state-of-the-art model in false positive rates. A false positive rate would mean that you falsely positively predict somebody is healthy, right? And if you had a higher rate of this in one subpopulation like women, then this deployed model would lead to a higher rate of no treatment in women who needed treatment. So when we audit the state-of-the-art model, we find that it has the lowest uh, performance rate and the largest underdiagnosis rate in female patients, young patients, black patients, and patients on Medicaid insurance. And patients who have an intersectional identity, that means that they are maybe a black or Hispanic female patient, they do worse than their aggregated group. And this is not just limited to this imaging data. What happens when we learn on things like clinical notes? Surely you've heard of language models at this point, especially at this conference. What happens when we ask a language model to complete a clinical note, which is an application they're being used for? If I fill in the first word in this template, blank patient was belligerent and violent, and ask the model to fill in the rest of the note, but fill it in saying Caucasian or white, the model says, send that patient to the hospital. If I say a African, African-American, or black patient was belligerent and violent, the language model fills in the rest of the clinical note with prison. These are really difficult things if we want to move forward with ethical AI in health. This is an ongoing process that's going to require diverse data and diverse engagement from teams, starting from problem selection and moving all the way through post-deployment considerations. Most of the time in machine learning, we really focus on step four, algorithm development. Make me a better model. I want a fancier model. I want a higher capacity model. But today I want to talk you through three short examples that make just as big a difference in data collection, outcome definition, and post-deployment considerations. Why would I care about data collection? Well, I care about data collection because there are deeply embedded proxies for societal biases in health data that lead to some of those problems that we just identified. How deep could these things go? Well, there's a big debate right now. Should we remove demographic features like self-reported race from patient medical records so that models can't use it to learn? What happens when we look at a note like this where the self-reported race has been redacted? Clinicians can't actually tell whether the self-reported race of this patient is black or white, but models can. And they can do it really well, and sometimes they're using things that we think maybe are fair game, like using statistical correlations between disease prevalence in certain groups, and sometimes they're using the fact that you call the patient difficult, and that means they are much more likely to be black. And again, this is not just isolated to one modality. What about medical imaging data? Can any of you tell if this patient would self-report the race black or white? And remember, that comes from a really heterogeneous, a very diverse genetic ancestry, that identity. So clinicians can't. We tested radiologists, but models can. And they can really, really accurately on a variety of different imaging modalities. And it's not the obvious spurious correlations that you might imagine you could remove from medical imaging data. It's not body mass index, breast density, bone density. It's not disease distribution. In fact, you can filter this image in a variety of ways until it doesn't really look like a chest x-ray anymore. And machine learning models can still tell the self-reported race of a patient. This is information that's incredibly deeply proxied in data. And you can't just remove it simply. So if we can't remove it simply from our data, 
How does this impact how we might want to learn? Another thing to think about is how we define outcomes. The way that we define outcomes right now is often with these standard labeling practices in machine learning. What's a standard labeling practice? Let's say I want to build a machine learning model that classifies whether this meal violates a school meal policy, and the meal policy prohibits high sugar. The way that we would do this is we would give this image to labelers and ask them, does this meal have high sugar content? And then we would build a machine learning model that classifies this meal according to the majority label. However, we wanted to know how would this differ if we actually asked people the question in context? In one setting, we're asking them the factual label. And in the other, we're asking them the normative question that this data is going to be applied to. We found that if you ask if this meal has high sugar content, 17 out of 20 people said yes. If you ask whether the meal violates a school policy that prohibits high sugar content, a majority of people said no, it doesn't. So what happens when we collect data in one regime, this descriptive sense, train models, and then apply them to the normative sense? We looked at four different human rule settings, trained machine learning models, and looked at this gap, this difference in these settings. And what happens is the machine learning models that we're training right now with the outcome labeling practices we have create much harsher judgments than if we would have collected labels from humans for the normative setting that we were applying these models to. The final thing I want to talk about is post-deployment considerations. Let's say we've trained the very best model that we can. We've collected the data, we've defined the outcome, we've optimized the algorithm, and now we need to go and deploy it. The problem is we really need to ensure that our deployed model is actually going to improve and augment human care. Let's take a setting where GPT models could be applied. I want you to summarize this transcript to a college crisis line. And I want you to give some advice to participants, clinicians and non-clinicians, who have to make a simple decision, whether we should send emergency medical help to the caller's location or call for police. Now, importantly, we trained people so that there was an if and only if condition. So if there's a risk of violence, then you should call for the police. But in all other cases, you should call for medical help. And so we did this at baseline with no advice to see how people did. And then we decided to train some GPT models to give people advice in two ways. We either intentionally trained biased, evil GPT models to constantly recommend that you should always call the police some minorities, or we had an unbiased model for a control that would not disproportionately recommend you call the police some minorities. Now, we thought that this is what was going to make a difference, the biased or the unbiased GPT model. And then we allowed it to make recommendations in two ways. We either gave people the if condition, which is one way you could label things, right? There is a risk of violence. Or we gave them the then condition, you should call the police. Importantly, for the machine learning model, these are the same label, because you only call the police if there's a risk of violence, this if and only if. And so this, we thought, should not make a big difference, the tiny detail of how we deploy the advice, prescriptively or descriptively. But what we found is, while at baseline, clinicians and non-clinicians are not more likely to call the police on minorities, when you give them biased prescriptive advice, when the GPT model tells them what to do in a biased way, they listen to it, and they disproportionately call the police on minorities. When you give them the same biased advice descriptively, you say there's a high risk of violence consistently for minorities, they ignore it. It allows them to retain their original fair decision making. So what really mattered here was how we told them the advice, not that it was bad. This is really important because we want to move forward with safe integration. And in order to do this, we really need to take lessons from areas where we do have safe technology deployment, like aviation. And in aviation, there's strong regulation. There's a culture of safety. And there are training standards that mitigate automation bias, where you have to train with the AI-assisted tools. And so here, we think in order to move forward with ethical AI, we can't just focus on one part of this pipeline. We need to consider sources of bias in the data that we collect, including the labels. We need to evaluate our models comprehensively as we're developing algorithms. And we need to recognize that not all gaps can be corrected. But maybe they don't have to if you deploy them intelligently such that when they are wrong, they don't disproportionately bias care staff. And by doing this, we think that we can create actionable insights in human health. Thank you.